So welcome to those of us, those of you joining us via live stream. A special thanks, I just want to say very um, special thanks to Vince Staley, who is actually not only a former board member of Philanthropy New York Chair, but actually putting this, this program together for us. Um, Media Impact Funders has been doing some really exciting things, and I'm glad that he's including us in it. Um, just some basic housekeeping for those folks of you who are joining us here in New York City. Um, the bathrooms are in the hall near the elevators. You'll need to stop and grab a key on your way out. Um, and some of you may know that we encourage uh, social the use of social media. This I remember. The use of social media um, during our programs. And we've actually created what's called a program openness scale. You may have gotten one of those on your way in. So today is mostly open. So you can pretty much feel free to tweet and post to your heart's content. Yes. Um, before I turn it over to, I want to do a very short introduction. Vince Staley is the executive director of the Media Impact Funders, an affinity group, a foundation of officials and philanthropists who support public interest media. Before joining public interest media, Vince was the program director of nonprofit sector support at the Cerner Foundation. And prior to joining that, which I didn't actually know this until today, was a reporter for 10 years where he covered a broad range of issues about the nonprofit sector. Very exciting. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Vince. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Yvonne, for that very warm introduction. Appreciate that. It's always good to be back here conspiring with our friends at Philanthropy New York. Um, and I think we've got a really great program today. It's an ex especially exciting time to be presenting a briefing about TED. Um, some of you may have been fortunate to attend TED Live um, uh, at the main event, which occurs each year in Long Beach. Uh, many more will have had a TED experience through the myriad TEDx events, um, which adopt the, the set of TED, uh, but uh, are curated and produced by independent uh, entities uh, around the world uh, who agree to use TED's uh, methodology. But by far, the, the way that most people, I think, appreciate and experience TED is through the distribution of TED Talks at TED.com. And I read in their materials today, have been watched by more than 500 million people, uh, I'm sorry, 500 million times. And I suspect it's like the old McDonald's sign, uh, where eventually they just have to say billions and billions served. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's coming. Um, so TED operates a motto, ideas worth spreading. And I think it's a motto we all should live by, but TED has done a really exemplary job promoting uh, innovative and provocative ideas. And today we're going to get a better understanding of how they've done that, how they and we're going to dig in a little bit into their methodology and also to uh, exciting opportunities in the future. Some of you may, may have read recently about one of the current stars of TED, Ron Finley, who was profiled recently prominently in the New York Times. Um, Ron was thrust, thrust from his relative obscurity to idea superstardom with his aggressive mission to beautify urban neighborhoods and to provide healthy eating options for people in those neighborhoods. Um, at the same time, last week marked the first occasion when TED broadcast its own television program, actual television, uh, a special on education at PBS. And I don't know if any of you saw that, but it was a really remarkable program uh, and a great way to for this online enterprise to now come full circle and, and deliver its programs through the traditional TV medium. There are, of course, countless other Ron Finley's representatives online and on their programs in Long Beach and at TED, TED events around the world. Um, today we're going to hear from TED curator Chris Anderson about his, uh, his mission and his purpose. Ted, Chris had a, a very successful career in journalism and publishing for TED in 2001. 2001. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to hear how TED reflects Chris's own philanthropic mission and purpose, and how TED hopes to, to expand relations with other nonprofits and foundations um, in a fundamentally different way going forward. We're, we're really, uh, I think, at, at an interesting meeting, because this is, I think, the first time uh, Chris and his team have opened up the, a, a really um, 
uh, white space for relations with nonprofits and foundations to change it from a project orientation to a more strategic relationship. So we're really thrilled to be a venue to have that discussion. We're also going to hear from Cohen, executive producer of TED Media, about her work in new directions through media and festivals and in many other ways. Um, and to help us understand TED's place in the media ecosystem, um, we're also very fortunate to have with us today Yvette Alberdique Time, who is the executive director of Witness, and Witness is the leading international video advocacy organization. Um, and I should say, with Yvonne's uh, acknowledgement earlier, everybody here um, worked in media and journalism. So for all of the tens of thousands of reporters who are losing their jobs in journalism, there is a future. There is an opportunity to do something else with your lives. Um, uh, at least it's worked out for, for us here. Um, now, we often think about the, the kind of the, the fundamental revolution in media and technology um, where uh, through online exchange, everyone has an opportunity to express themselves. Charlie bit my finger is probably one of the seminal <laughs> moments in, uh, in, in online video. Um, and, you know, there are great examples of kind of uh, wacky, funny, um, uh, you know, strange superstars, but at the same time, what I think Ted has done is taken that same disintermediation idea of being able to go direct to the consumer with their ideas, with their media, and reach a really um, remarkable audience, hundreds of, 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 of millions of views. That's something that any other organization has the um, infinite potential for, but uniquely achieved. And so I think we, as funders, as nonprofits, we really have a lot to learn from, from, from Ted just in um, how to do it, uh, how they do it, um, but also um, now having built that platform, what can we do together with it? So with that, I would just um, you know open the floor to Chris, and we're going to have a, a very lively conversation, discussion with everyone in the room. And certainly, I want to acknowledge for those of you on the live stream, tweet your questions and comments in. We'll try and keep an eye on them and keep it as lively and and um, global as we possibly can. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vince. <clears throat> Thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, before the day is done. You should know that we're hoping to extract wisdom from every mind around the table here. Uh, our mission is ideas worth spreading. That's a two-way thing. Um, I wish I could share with you my vision, uh, but actually all this didn't start with a vision. It started with a question. Um, and I think it's a question we all probably spend um, a lot of time asking in this room. How do you convert money into social impact? I mean, how do you do it? It's actually quite a teasing question. I mean, you could take a suitcase to Africa and sort of hand it out. You know, that's one idea. Most of us <laughs> think that there's, there's a better way. Um, but what are the ways in which you can amplify human intention? Well, how can you leverage the act of giving? When I started the Southern Foundation in 1996, I had no clue what the answer was to that question. I mean, it felt like you know, that was a question I wanted to find an answer to. I wanted to try and do some sort of chapter two after an entrepreneurial career, give that, all that stuff. Um, but I, I really didn't know how. Um, some of the things that excited me, and I thought had potential, were you know, technology. Um, technology seems to have that sort of leverage effect. Make a solar light, you could help someone more than just you know, give for a day or something. Um, design seemed really interesting. The fact that human, we have this ability to repattern the future and make it work better. Maybe you should invest in design. Hmm. That was interesting. Education. You know, obviously, huge potential there. Entrepreneurship really interested me. And given my background, mass media, the, the amazingness that you could take one piece of knowledge and then at the click of a printing press or a web page or whatever, allow many millions to see it. That, that excited me. But um, what you actually did, did was a problem, and, and I guess that's why when I first went to TED in 98, um, we all started turning, because 
TED was this weird thing. It was this conference, it was a private conference for profit. Um, 800 people met in California. Um, and, um, um, but something strange happened there, that these people got incredibly inspired, and worked up and passionate and excited, and would say things like, this is the best week of my year. Um, and the four days that um, I went through there ended with me sort of bursting with a sense of possibility and desire to do something. And um, the, the, the media person in me and the sort of budding philanthropist in me thought, so there is something here. I don't know what it is. Um, cut a long story short, um, three, three or four years later, I was able to buy this conference through, through the foundation, um, $6 million in investment. Uh, for the foundation at the time. And um, and we began this journey of figuring out, now that TED is not a for-profit thing, it's a non-profit thing, how do we make it for the world? How, how do we turn this into something? And I got very excited about a new way of framing an answer to the question, which is idea, the idea itself, an idea, in certain circumstances, is the ultimate piece of leverage. Um, because ideas really change how people are. And in certain circumstances, they give their own propagation. Um, they can excite someone so much that, that, that they themselves forward it on to other people. And so it's, you know, dropping an idea into a pond, you know, the ripples spread, and um, far edges of the pond can feel, feel the impact. Um, and so Ted, um, became this quest to try and find a way of letting the ideas that have been expressed at TED, you know, get out there into the world. And at the time, to actually do that was not, not so easy, you know, to, to share a lecture here in California to, say, someone in Mozambique um, would involve, I don't know, putting it onto a DVD, mailing it, the world, you know, at most your sort of unit cost at scale to do that would be two or three dollars a time. And something amazing happened in the in the world of technology, which is that online video took off, bandwidth rates were were plunging, and suddenly it became possible to distribute um, via the web. Um, a twenty minute lecture suddenly instead of costing two or three dollars to get out there, cost a penny or two in the end bandwidth term. So that was, that was spectacular, because at that level, it could be sponsored by someone. It was effectively free. And suddenly, you could think completely differently about um, the leverage potential here. So we tried an experiment. June, June here led the, the, the charge on it. And um, um, after failing to persuade TV companies to take TED and go that media route, we, we put six talks up on the web. Um, Hopeful, but also thinking um, these little four square inches of video, generally video, possibly work this way they work live, can they? Um, and um, also, are we giving away our crown jewels? You know, we get all our revenue from people paying to come to the conference. Why are we being crazy giving stuff away? Turned out both answers to those questions worked out well. Um, the response to these. Tiny little, I don't know if you remember online video back in 2006, but it was, um, it, it looked horrible. And, um, uh, and and yet, we got these emails back from people saying their lives had been touched by these things, that they'd had real conversations with their family for the first time, that they had sent to all their friends, etc. And we thought, wow, we're thinking about our organization completely wrong. We are not a conference. Um, we're, we're ideas we're spreading. That's what we're going to be. And given that, how do we engineer ourselves going forward? And so June, working with, with an amazing team, um, created a website you know, designed to set talks free to all who would, would want them. And to our amazement, these things started taking off. We, we were five or six thousand people a day were coming on looking at these talks because Ted was 800 people once a year and five or six thousand people a day seemed good. And, um, you know, of the last six, seven years, that number has just gone up. It's so currently over 2 million views a day. Um, and actually a, a billion, more than a billion now. There we whatever. go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, um, and, that, and that's been 
willing to see. Um, someone might say, actually, ideas don't and not the issue. Ideas are cheap. Ideas are a dime a dozen. What matters is is doing something with those ideas, and that is true. Um, but one of the amazing things about live talk is that you can wrap an idea with something dangerous, uh, something packed with potential, namely the ability to ignite an idea in someone's brain. We call it inspiration. Um, it's a very mysterious thing. But when a certain speaker unveils what's important to them and why, and looks around at an audience in the right circumstances and with the right context, something truly spectacular can happen in that audience and that they can not only understand the idea and be persuaded by an argument, they can feel right in the core of their being a sense of, I must do something with it. And, and that's where the idea becomes explosive and amazing because what they do with it, you know, it might just be to share it with, um, uh, Fifty grams, and that will do for a start. But it may rewire their thinking, their literally their brain, the extent that seventy years later, it changes who they are and how they think about the world. Um, so I, we, we find that incredibly exciting, and um, um, and have a, almost a sort of um, a philosophical belief in ideas, the right ideas, as having long-term power, even when you can't necessarily measure it, because you can't measure seventy years. We, we, we believe that there is um, something going there. Um, and um, that experience of seeing what happens when you, when you give it away, and what can, and when you give it away in a technological environment where these things can spread low friction, one click, one, one email to a list, suddenly, boom, this thing is spreading like wildfire. It made us really excited about the potential of giving things away and what that. Could do, and it, and it really informed our strategy since then. So, and again, bear in mind this is all part of this answer to this question: How do you leverage? Well, the place you leverage is, is by giving, because and let other people do the leveraging for you. Um, by giving away the talks, millions of people around the world became our marketers for free. You know, that's answer just because they were excited. Um, we gave away translation uh, rights to, to these talks. Um, uh, we gave away the transcripts. And to our delight, thousands of volunteer translators stepped forward and translated TED into more than 140 languages, working in pairs, unpaid, um, and doing work in quality terms measured actually better than a typical professional translator. We gave away our brand um, in the form of TEDx. We allowed people around the world to license it for free and do their own TED-like events. Um, and again, to our, to our astonishment, not dozens, but thousands of these events took place, more than 6,000 so far for now. Um, you, you, as an organization, you could not do this top down, but by, by letting go, um, it's been amazing to track. And these events have included you know, TEDx CERN, we just had, we've had TEDx Baghdad, TEDx Kabul. Um, TEDx cartoon was just shut down uh, by security, security forces there this week. Um, it, it's been astonishing to see, and the level of effort and attention to detail on some of these events has, has uh, taught us a lot. It's been it's led to 25,000 uh, TEDx being available, uploaded for free to anyone on YouTube. We just had a TEDx in the Sydney Opera House, 2,000 people, and uh, wonderful quality. Um, but, um, we've suddenly you know, have, have this sort of Global network of people we can learn from who are acting in this amazing content creation source. So, um, I think we're still asking more questions than we have answers to. But, but the process of seeing that initial six million dollar turn into this self-fueled um, global force now, which is quite outside of control. We're we're hundred people. We're actually a tiny organization. We're hundred people. Um, we have about about $50 million in revenue. Um, but we have tens of thousands of people out there in the world who are working on our account because we've let them. Um, we've, we've given them the tools um, and um, 
the three ideas, which has ended up getting them excited and, um, uh, and you know, they've, they've surprised us at every step of the way. So that's been that's been something to see. Now we we, in terms of our relationship with with um, foundations, uh, um, we have undergone some wonderful experiences experiments, um, but we're still in the early days in how we think of that relationship. And uh, a bit later today, I'd like to uh, share with you some of our thinking about the direct may want to push that. Frankly, get your feedback to see if we're crazy or not. Um, because we, we think there's so much wisdom out there that we have not properly tapped into yet, some of it in this room right now. Um, and um, so that's that's for a bit. But I guess I'm going to hand over to... Yeah, so let, let me just uh, say that, uh, I mean, that's a very exciting start for us. I think we should bookmark this question of your strategy to go open and uh, to, to sort of allow other people to use your brand. Um, that sounds like a very bold and generous step. It also probably comes with costs. And maybe we can circle back and say, you know, you, you acknowledge that you're doing something that has risks associated with it. How then do you manage that, I think, would be something if we can come back to. But I, I'd love to hear, June, now, uh, tell us about your work with the media and aspects of that. Sure. So in many ways, I'll be... Um Filling in some details along the way that Chris had shared. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, so Ted, Ted began just as the, the quick little nutshell leading into a 19 as a conference focused on technology, entertainment, and design. So, that's the TED in Ted. We go off on things like technology, education, and development. It's technology, entertainment, and design. And um, Ted began as a, as a closed system. As Chris said, it was uh, expensive, it was elite. What happened at Ted stayed in Ted. And in 2005, Chris uh, made the decision that talks were too good to keep to ourselves and that there was only so much impact if you were only talking to a thousand people in a room, no matter who those people were. And so he made the decision, which was pretty radical at the time, to put the talks online for free, as he said, first as a podcast series in 2006 and then as TED.com. And we've been pretty amazed and humbled by what has happened since. So we have now have 1,500 talks online. They've been viewed more than a billion times. And the question that we, I actually ask myself all the time about this is, is why? So why have, why have they proved so popular? They are essentially taped lectures. So what is it about them that has captivated people around the world? You know, when we launched them, we thought we would be speaking pretty small, geeky audience, you know, an audience of people who love school and love lectures. And it turns out to be so much broader than that. It's truck drivers and yoga and police chiefs in Mumbai. And um, I want to share with you a couple of the questions we've made about why the talks themselves are traveling so far. Um, as media funders, I think you'll find it interesting. The first um, conclusion is that actually people love to learn. So not everybody loves school, not everybody thinks they're smart, but everyone, when they're in the presence of a speaker who shares with them knowledge that they didn't have, curiosity and passion, it lights people up inside. When they're able to understand something they thought would be um, uh, beyond them, when um, it opens up a possibility in them that they didn't know they had, Everybody in the end um, loves to learn. And there are also some practical things about these talks that I think have helped them succeed. And this is that we try to make our speakers rock stars. Our speakers are themselves generally um, uh, not rock star material. They're scientists, they're professors, they're inventors, they're sometimes politicians, they're poets. But we try to film them in a way that makes them a rock star. And that's what we mean by that. We pay a lot of attention to production values. To, to practical things like lighting and uh, sound and shooting them with multiple cameras so that we can get good tight shots of. Most lectures are filmed like a, um, a high school musical with one camera in the back of the room and nobody is interesting when they're filmed with one camera. So we put a lot of... Um, Except in today's production. <laughs> Except here. <laughs> Which is actually quite good. <laughs> I'm going to try. We're singing out. Um... <laughs> And then the, the next is that we've tried to reach people everywhere. We didn't try to just force people to come to TED.com, but we recognize that media habits are changing and changing really quickly, that there are so many different ways of watching video. It's not just on their laptop. They watch it on, now, on their cell phone, on their tablets. They, they watch TV on their TVs. They, they consume their media in so many different ways. And we've known from the beginning that we had to have a strategy of reaching, reaching people in multiple ways, and we had to also stay flexible. 
so that people can continue to find us. Everywhere they're watching video, we wanted them to be able to watch TED Talks. And the next one slide there, the next one is also that it would be um, free. We've always embraced open models. We released the talks under a Creative Commons license so that they can be shared. We've committed that they will always be available for free online because we wanted to find the most the widest possible audience. But another reason that we think the talks have succeeded, and this goes to much of what Chris was saying about inspiration, is that um, it's one thing for a talk, for uh, anything online to be good, um, but for it to be shared and for it to go viral, it actually has to make you want to share it. It has to inspire in you some kind of contagious emotion that says, I need to share this with my friends. And that's actually a little bit different from just being good. Now, you might think of viral videos like the, the one you were mentioning earlier, Vince, the Charlie bit my thing. You think of the silly viral ones that spread because they're, they're embarrassing or um, crude. But there are other contagious emotions, like when you've learned something that you didn't think you could learn, when you have that aha moment, you want to share it with someone, or when something lifts you above yourself and you're inspired by it and filled with awe, you want someone by your side. And so I want to just share with you one clip um, so we're about to go to the video, because um, I know we switch into a different system. Um, I'm going to share with you a clip of one, a clip from a very classic TED Talk. It was one of the first six that we put online. And I, I think of it as our most unlikely viral video of all time. So the star of this, the speaker, is a man named Hans Rosling. He is a professor, Swedish professor of global health who uses statistics to debunk myths about the developing world. And by all rights, that should be the most boring thing you have ever seen in your life. But he has become, he has nine talks on TED.com right now. Cumulatively, they've been watched more than any other. He is a true internet rock star. So I'm going to show you this brief clip. And in it, Hans is about to explain to us the difference between um, the first world and the developing world. And just a quick question. For the yes. live stream audience, do we have the link out? We're putting it out. Yeah, so you'll have a link um, to uh, try this at home, kids. Yeah, so you have the URL and just start it at uh, 229, and you'll be you'll be right with us. Uh, so let's give this. Uh, oh, I don't. Yeah. 
is called the end of the number of the Bible is the miracle that happens in the end. The mass of the family planning. And they move up into that corner. And in 90, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and sport and we have a completely new world. And we can stop there. Yeah. So that um, that talk is represented by the like, works and was spread because it did so many things right. You know, it taught it made you see the world in a new way. It gave you that kind of aha moment. But it also showed it to you in a way you'd never seen before. And on top of that, it also got to show you. It always touches me on an emotional level when the African countries start to sink. I can always feel my stomach sink with with, with them. And all of those are emotions that just make you want to share it. And so um, thanks to these wonderful, inspired speakers like Han, so many of the talks have really touched people at their core. And one of the uh, challenges that um, Chris and I have had over time in the team is that we've seen so many people want to take part in building. And we've seen one of our social challenges and opportunities is figuring out how do we feed this hunger for participation? How do we let people in? And that's been kind of um, the, the note that Chris is definitely sounding with us on the team, how do we get compassion instead of sort of squelching it when we find it? So since the very beginning, we've been getting emails like this. So for example, I'm a 19-year-old student from Poland. I want to help spread the ideas. I can translate your videos into Polish. This is a month after we started publishing the talks. I want to translate, these are real emails. I want to translate those into Korean. If I could give you Hebrew subtitles, would you use them? Sometimes people would just send us subtitled videos saying, here, and um, their, their requests started, and no, notice they weren't asking us subtitles, they wanted, they wanted to subtitle them. And they got very specific over time, they were like, no, we've been talking, us potential translators, but we want you to launch a project where you allow anyone to subtitle the talks into any language. So it was not our grand strategy here, but rather just listening to our community when we launched our open translation project four years ago, and this was a program that allowed volunteers around the world to subtitle the talks into any language. And we launched it with pretty modest expectations. We were hoping to maybe have 100 translators someday. And as Chris mentioned earlier, the results are pretty stunning. So we have 40,000 translations in 100 languages. There are actually 140 languages in progress, 100 of them already published by 9,000 volunteers around the world. Um, so all of these languages, around 15 of them, there are more than 1,000 talks available functionally. Just the entire archive has been translated with the rest of the talks in progress. And this incredible translation effort has really been driven by individuals. So this is Anwar Dafa Ala. He, um, he is a Muslim Sudanese who uh, went, uh, got his PhD in Seoul. He's just moved back to Sudan. And he has single-handedly translated 900 talks into Arabic. And he sees this part of his personal mission in life when there's no good news for his own country. He focuses on the good that he can do in the world, and that's one of his outlets. And so this, um, over time, in addition to the subtitle, we've now started to expand, and in around a month's time, we'll launch the Arabic version of TED.com. So those were for the subtitles, uh, for subtitles alone, but we feel the last barrier is translating the entire website, so someone who is not fluent in Gate. Um, Arabic, um, the Arabic version is also translated by volunteers. It'll go live in around a month, and it'll be followed by other uh, languages. And this is also going out across our, um, our um, apps as well. So then uh, we started to get these other uh, emails at the same time, uh, around the same time as the other ones, of people asking us to do events with them around the world. So we get um, emails like this. We want to host an event in Amsterdam. Can you come to Brazil? Can you come to China? And um, of course, we couldn't go to all these places. Our events are, uh, we do two or three a year, and that almost kills us on its own. We would never have the capacity to do all these events. But Chris had an insight that I think do it um, and he said, well, we can't hold these events, but, but why can't they? Um, if we're seeing this passion, why can't they hold these events? And so we launched a program also four years ago called TEDx, as Chris mentioned, that allows people around the world to hold their own locally organized TEDx events. So there's a TEDx uh, cartoon, TEDx Baghdad, um, Beijing, TEDx Great Wall of China. And um, again, I actually thought we would only have a couple dozen of these events when we launched it. Chris thought it would be bigger than that, but I was the most wrong. Um, because to date, there have been um, more than 7,000 TEDx events, 1,900 cities, 150 countries, 50 languages. And these really run a gamut so beautifully. Some of them are um, 
beautiful, ornate events in uh, capitals of the world that rival any event. Oh, sorry, it's normally auto. It normally auto focuses is what I'm going to click through. So there's beautiful, ornate events that rival really anything that we could hold. But also there's wonderful events in rural Rajasthan, or this is an event that takes place regularly in a shanty town in Kibera outside of uh, Nairobi in Kenya, where they're literally holding that in, uh, in, in, in a shack with a corrugated metal roof. But the ideas shared at events like that are no more profound or meaningful to their communities than the ones where um, they're more opulent uh, uh, cousins. And as Chris mentioned, one of the things that's so amazing about these events is that for all of our planning about what could go wrong, you can imagine our planning around what could go wrong with an event like this, um, is that um, all, almost all of the unintended consequences have been explosively positive, that we have basically an R&D lab around the world where we watch these events and their live streams, and we learn from them. We're like, that's interesting. That's a great speaker. That's a great interview they just held during the break, or, wow, maybe we should do that with our program, as we're constantly learning them. Now, the goal with all of these programs has always been extremely focused. We have not been, uh, we didn't launch TED Talks or anything after that to make money, and we didn't launch them to sell conference tickets, and we haven't launched any of this to build the TED brand. Our single focus has always been on spreading ideas. And that's one of the things that I think has um, underlined our, our um, relationships that we've begun building with foundations, because we have a very, we're very mission-driven. We have a goal that's very aligned with so many others in the nonprofit sector. And the way we've started to think about our relationships with foundations is, can we ask questions together? There are so many interesting questions that we're trying to answer. And so we look for partners not just to bring money to the table, which is less interesting to us, but can we answer questions together? And so just a few quibbles of how we've worked with foundations to date, and just very quickly. So with the Gates Foundations, we focus on how do you spread impactful ideas in the developing world, just with so many of the solutions that they're looking for come down to figuring out, we found the right ideas, but how do we get them to actually spread? So a few examples, they've been great supporters of our TEDx program. They supported the, the design, development, and creation of what we call TEDx in a box. Uh, we found that for our orders in the developing world, they simply don't have the tools to hold an event. They often don't have electricity, they don't have the money for a projector or for video cameras to record the talks. And so there's this beautiful um, box that was designed with a partner IDEO. It includes like the smallest, lightest projector we could find, a tiny camera on a tiny tripod. Um, it includes a, a battery so you don't need electricity. You can actually power it with a car engine if you need to. So a lot of just thoughtful design going into how do we support um, uh, TEDx organizers who uh, are in, in the developing world. They also... Um, Built an annual event, sometimes semi-annual, called TEDx Change, where they put um, their own speakers on who they feel have the most powerful ideas that deserve to spread. Um, and we orchestrate uh, between 10 and 50 uh, satellite of throughout the developing world, which they fund, so that they can find an audience for these ideas that they're trying to put forward. And then, of course, those uh, talks are after they're recorded also go uh, online. Um, finally, they also funded a new subtitle system for us under oath so that we could have our translators begin to work not just on our official TED Talks, but on TEDx Talks. There are 25,000 TEDx Talks online, many of them in other languages. And what we've found is that oftentimes there will be a small, great talk from, say, rural Rajasthan that isn't interesting to our Google TED.com audience, but might be really interesting to a similar rural community in Brazil. And if it can be translated from... Um, or, or Tamal into Portuguese, they can bypass English altogether. And so we've actually been, put the system up now so that our translators can translate TEDx talks as well as our official TED talks. Um, two other examples, TED and the Robin Hood Foundation. The question we've asked together is how can we measure the impact of philanthropy? This was just a small project we did together. It looked like this. <laughs> it took place at one of our events, and we pulled together a great group of people to think together for several days over the course of coming um, up. And there were a mixture of engineers, designers, uh, people in the nonprofit space thinking about how do we develop effective metrics and um, really use the open source community uh, to, to communicate about these online. And finally, we have a new partnership, a new ish partnership with the Knight Foundation on how can we move users from ideas into action? Knight is, of course, very interested in how you empower communities, particularly in our post newspaper era. Um, and they are, are funding all kinds of people in this space from um, startups to media companies and so on. And they've brought a great deal of thinking to this space with us. As we think about, we know, um, as Chris mentioned earlier, when people watch a great talk, they're inspired, they want to do something. How do we capture that? Um, 
haven't really tried to yet, but with Knight's um, partnership, we're beginning to investigate that and we're asking questions like what inspires a user to engage more deeply, how do we best connect ideas with appropriate actions, and how do we do this with while retaining our identity as a media company and not becoming an activist network per se. And those are the questions that we're asking as we lead a project that will uh, soon have something to show with the world. So um, that's just the, um, the background I wanted to give as we head into um, the next phase of the conversation on kind of on what we've done to date. And Chris, I know you want to pick up from there on um, kind of what, what we're thinking as we move forward. So before we do that, yeah. um, I, I just kind of put Yvette Alberting time on the spot a little bit to, <laughs> to put her up here in front and everything like that. But she's a good sport and she knows a lot. So uh, I think what Yvette can do is to help us begin the conversation in the room by reflecting on this remarkable capacity of TED and to say sort of, where in the sort of media firmament this fits in, I think, being in the vanguard of, of using the incredible revolutionary power of uh, network media for social purpose. Yeah. Still on the spot? I, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by everything I've heard. I hope you are too. Um, yeah, I would say, um, further to Chris and June are saying, it feels to me like this is really only the beginning um, because um, we're a small organization, but there was originally an idea. And the idea was, what, what if every human rights defender has a camera in their hand, what would they film and what could they change? Now, that's 20 years ago. So that idea took hold, and actually we, at some point, also um, uh, were able to use the TED platform to present some of those ideas. Um, but, but it had a lot to do with leveraging media and technology technology to really share ideas and to get people inspired to take action. So I think a lot of what Chris and June are talking about, if you apply to the world of philanthropy, we're all here together to inspire change in the world. And I know for a fact that media can be unbelievably catalyzing. Like I remember the Brian Stevenson talk at TED from the Equal Justice Initiative, where he talks and you see him and he tells a story about his grandmother and then he looks into the camera and he says when is the last moment you were the last time you were actually in a poor person's home and 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 i was sitting among a lot of people from silicon valley who i would bet had not been in a poor person's home for quite a long time and i there was a sense of inspiration there's also a sense of wow i want to take action and that is the power of visual media because now there's that compassion where you can directly relate and now linking that to the technology that we all have in our hands like this is the way we share our worlds these days right i think there's an incredible opportunity to do this um, that goes far beyond just spreading the idea but creating the communities many of the ted events have created because because they've created a platform for people who come together and as many of us in the, for me in the activist community, for you in the in the philanthropy world, know is the only way we're going to solve these problems is if there are communities created of all these different stakeholders where they, where these ideas can actually be shared and where people can build on these ideas together. So that would be my first. Uh, I feel a little bit like I'm on like a show, you know, what's it? Correct like answer. Dancing with the stars. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So that I'm going to be the nice seven. jury member. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Well, so th thank you very much for, for a good sport, Yvette. Uh, and also, I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, this is a conversation that really deserves a full day of, uh, of conference uh, unto itself. And fortunately, we have a full day conference uh, on June 4th at the Foundation Media Impact Funders is going to be sponsoring a uh, uh, a day-long conference, uh, our Media Impact Forum on impact storytelling and really delving into how visual media um, is, uh, you know, incredibly powerful in uh, promoting social impact and how do we measure that. Um, we're going to have a great lineup. We've got uh, Abby Disney, who's the chair of the Daphne Foundation, whose executive director is here and gave the introduction today, um, and many others. Uh, so really, we'd love to dive deeper into this, and of course that is our uh, main purpose as an organization, the Media Impact Funders. But now I want to uh, give Chris and June an opportunity to 
to go up another level and say, now that we've created this incredible platform of media and, and networking with the billions of people around the world, um, what can we do with it? What can we do with it together and with nonprofits and philanthropy? So, take it away. I'd be happy to um, just want to get any feedback or, or other questions or uh, from, from anyone if you're on what you've heard so far, and then maybe in a, maybe in a few minutes' time or lay out yeah. some of our thinking about some of the questions we're asking about the, the direction about relationship. But I'd I'd, um, um, I'd love to take any any questions or comments. And if you want to identify yourself, that would be okay. great. You okay. don't have to for the live stream, but please feel free. Or maybe for the translation in particular and for TEDx. Sure. Sure. It's um um it's slightly a scary thing to do to give your brand away, and um, <laughs> um, that, and the, the assumption is that that it will go horribly wrong. Um, just occasionally it does, but the, the, the amazingness is how uh, often um, we're just blown away by the, the efforts that people put, put in. So with, with the free license, the free license is given under certain terms and conditions. You're meant to follow a certain format and you're meant to keep clear of, of certain uh, ways in which the agenda could be, could be manipulated or misused. So we don't want to misuse commercially, politically. Religiously, or for, for tax science, those are the kind of four areas of guideline that we try and steer people away from. Um, beyond that, they can they can come up with their program and, and take ownership of it. And the, the amazing thing is how great most of those programs have been. So, if um, our approach has been let people try it, if if they screw up, we will find out about it. They won't get the renewal. But by by giving by basically saying go try. That is what has nurtured this explosion in that. So out of probably 25,000 plus videos that are up on YouTube, um, probably a dozen or so have given us cause for concern. Uh, we pulled down a, a few, with sticking warning labels on a couple, but it's, it's a, I, I view it really as, as, as a bit like Wikipedia. Wikipedia, when, you, when it was, that was first explained, seemed impossible. There was no way that that could yield something Great. And the truth is that there are literally millions of errors in Wikipedia. But uh, it, is, um, it, is, it, is what, it is this great gift to humanity and technology overall. So by, by, by letting go, embracing a bit of chaos, um, it's, it's amazing what comes out of it. But we do, we do watch, we do listen, we do have a global community. We're increasingly wise about what counts as, as, as you know, what the rules are and, and do find out if people steer away. The, the number one thing is how motivated most people are to respect the brand, keep to the rules. They want to do this not just once, but for years. So they may as all the time. So the, the sound you just heard was a, a video that I just sort of randomly asked uh, Beta and company over there to, to load up. Just as, a, as an example, I saw that there were translations. So maybe we could just take a quick look at a, how the translations work for oh, a moment. Sure. So for example... So if you can, we're just flying by sight here. Okay. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, where so, it says languages. Yeah, if you mouse over languages. Uh, no, so, uh, on the control screen. bar. Yes. And if you click on that, where it says languages off, it'll show you all the languages. So there are, I think, 34 languages that Bill Gates' talk has been translated into. Maybe we pick like... Um, Beat is looking for Persian, but it may not be there. <laughs> it is a it's there. It's Persian. So select Persian. And you see that the headline and the top description also already changed into Persian. That's right to left for extra points. <laughs> and so click, let's uh, click the apply. What we can also do is that's coming on is we can show the um, transcript below. might be able to tell us whether that's a strong translation or not. But you'll notice that on the right, we've credited the translator. So underneath the description, it says translated into Persian by the person. You can, and you can it down. 
And um, and that represents one of one of the keys also to quality is that you have to provide both accountability. You have to we, we try to make them rock stars by by um, crediting them, but then it also creates that accountability. And then you can also take a look if you click on show transcript, uh, it's right under the video. Uh, you can select a language there as well. You could do it into a different one, like um, German. That's great. And you scroll down a bit. If you click anywhere in that German transcript, it will advance you to that point in the uh, talk. So you get kind of a three-lation tool going. And one other quick note on to Chris's on the practical end for both the translation project and TEDx. Um, there's a couple of like super simple principles, like we have a high barrier to entry for both. You, you have to work at it to get to get accepted to either of the programs. Um, and then we have great guidelines. As Chris said, most people, almost everyone wants to do a good job. We've never had a purposefully mistranslated talk, even though that was all we worried about before we launched it. It's never happened in four years. Um, and then credit people and provide accountability and a route for community feedback. And between those like five principles, it actually really makes openness uh, work. Great. Well, thank you yeah. for everyone for for agreeing to fly yes. uh, <laughs> without any guidance there. This is the Amara system, is that correct? It is. Yeah. 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 So, um, and then just for future reference, on June 4th, we'll have an hour-long session with the folks from Amara where we'll be talking about some of these tools, too. The technology of our subtitling system, they're also a nonprofit. Yeah, and we were talking about this before, and I think if you think about um, just and social change, how important language is, right? Because this, just a good idea here now can actually be, be reaching people who don't have access to it. That's all about access, like translation. And, and the fact that Ted has solved this problem is for us in the nonprofit world really, really exciting because this is very frequently like a barrier for people who are sitting on one part of the world to really be able to have access to knowledge and resources and tools. So it's it's, it's an amazing, uh, it's a good tool. Yeah, maybe if I could just underline to elaborate on the point, solving a problem at scale, you know, to have a platform that's large enough to actually take it on, that's not nonprofit style. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, unfortunately, we just generally don't. We try things out, we bootstrap everything. And so to be able to have a workshop that's large enough to actually manufacture the prototype and fly it out of the uh, a hangar is, you know, very useful. I just want to thank you. We have a grantee working very small and very small and very small and Can I just reiterate for the live stream and uh, identify you? Oh, yeah. So Christina Spellman from the Mayday Foundation was just uh, observing that one of their grantees became a rock star in their own small field. Uh, of pain management um, to help them to achieve that. And then that talk was then added to curricula in uh, the medical education in the developing world. And part of what you say goes, goes to the fact that we, we're all in um, permanent battle for attention. Um, now, that's, there's so many organizations, ideas, voices online. It's this crazy sort of frenzy of stuff. And part of the problem we all have to solve is how do you package a piece of knowledge in a form that people will actually take the time out and, and look at? And um, it, it's, it's not an adequate answer to that question, to, to have it be quite good. It kind of has to be um, you know, exceptional, so that people say, that is worth my forward with people. It's between a piece of media that 10 people will forward to 12 people, and 10 people will forward to 8 people. 
There's not a very big difference between those two. It's all in the detail. But the difference, one fizzles away quickly, the other goes viral. And, um, and so it's that, that we, we do put speakers to a lot of, uh, and actually a growing on top of sort of pressure. No, you have to respect the time limit. No, you have to strip out the irrelevant stuff. Um, a lot of speakers spend weeks and weeks sort of preparing their talks. But the, the leverage they get on that time investment turns out good for most of them. Another question? Yes. In the blue shirt, I think. I'll take the second one. You can have I guess the, the subversion question is, is uh, an important one, but a, a difficult one. One person's creation is another person's subversion. Um, we we actually try and uh, avoid politics and in 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 cartoon that their their agenda was not actually explicitly political. It was not let's have an Egyptian spring in um, you know in Sudan. Um, but it was, I guess, it was perceived as, as risky by someone in the security forces there. I, I think, I think, um, so, so I think that is subversive only if, if you take the view that people understanding the world is dangerous, that people being wiser about the future, people, people being connected to each other. If you think that's dangerous, then I guess that is could be dangerous. But it's not something that we, it's not a lens that we actively promote. What we promote is just. Let's try and get wiser about who we are. Let's try and get wiser about how we understand the world. Let's try and get wiser about future possibilities. And, and in, in a lot of areas, what is thrilling to see is how changing the subject to those, those questions, instead of the usual thing that people talk about and argue about, you know, my land, no my land, or you know, the, the, the traditional of old that people can't break out of, to have, a, to have discussion instead about, if we use this invention and did things in this way, we could all gain a better future. People find that exciting. One, you know, one of the thrills that brought TEDx organizers together was to see, for example, the TEDx organizers from Israel and some of the surrounding Arab countries talking together in a tent, animatedly connecting. So that was cool. Um, so the things that didn't work out, just one, there are of course many of them, but what... If you could just say for the live stream what the question was. Oh, sure, the question was, uh, we talked about many things that succeeded beyond what we expected, what didn't succeed more than we expected. So a good example was we launched, after um, TEDx and Open Translation Project, we launched something we called the Open TV Project, because we had been getting requests from TV stations around the world to show the talks. And so the thought was that we would launch a very similar program allowing TV stations to run the talks and it was successful in that it was picked up but what we discovered was that this kind of system doesn't work in a top, top down industry so the talks are being picked up by tv stations, but they were being run at three in the morning with no production values and not marketed so that's actually not super helpful in fact it was kind of hurting us we would hear from tedx organizers like why are you on that station? You're on like our public access station in the middle of the night. You're TED. So we've, we've pulled back on that um, program, but we've, what we've done is parlay it into a different approach where we work individually with TV stations around the world to make sure that if they're going to take the TED Talks, they're doing it properly, they're investing in it, they're, they're uh, in the proper amount of marketing resources and so on. And so we, we pulled back. So it was an interesting lesson for me and sort of when bottom-up works and when it doesn't. I wonder if you could just say a word then, it's uh, uh, taking it then forward to the PBS partnership, which you just did. Sure. Do you want to say a, just a yeah. word about that project? Sure. Well, um, it, it was a fun one for us because we this the whole project began, as Chris mentioned earlier, originally trying to bring talks to uh, TV. And um, <laughs> they, uh, at the time, no TV stations were interested in 
uh, the talks. And when the BBC told us it was too intellectual for them, we decided we needed to find a different strategy. And that's when we decided to put TED Talks online. And that sort of set us down the course that we're on now. And for years, it had been quite hard. Chris and I went in at times to different stations trying to the intersection between TED and TV. TED Talks still weren't seen as being sort of TV material. and But we just have just done our first TV special. It aired last week on PBS. And the way we approached it is we actually filmed it like a live TED session. Um, the problem we tended to have is that we would sit down with uh, TV networks and they would want to create a TV magazine show. Like, we'll get TED speakers, but then we'll interview them. We'll do something different. And we're like, well, that just makes it like everything else on TV. And Chris especially felt that we really needed to hold on to that essence of who we were, which was in the live Talks. And so it was, it was funded by um, the CPB, um, who, as part of their American graduate program, they really wanted to focus on how do you keep kids in school. And uh, we did an hour-long special curated by Chris and Juliet Blake, who's our wonderful head of, of TV. And, um, and we, we feel really good about the, the results. It was a strong um, hour-and-a-half session that was condensed into an hour for TV. And the individual talks are available on TED.com, and the full uh, show was shown on Yes. And you just pick some random people, Bill Gates and John Legend, <laughs> so whoever happened to be free that day. Uh, okay, so let's go here and then here. There's questions about attending TED, and there's, there's lots of different events now, and, and lot, we, we welcome people from foundations to um, attend, with the one caveat, most of our events sell out sort of a, a year or more in advance, so it's, that, that needs negotiating, but, but we simply welcome participation. As far as broader actual partnerships with foundations, this is, this is evolving fast at, at TED. To date, most of the involvement has been around specific projects, depending on a uh, foundation specific strategy we've met. Is there a meeting of minds? Is there a project that we could do that would match what, what you need? And that's been great, and it's led to some really good good things, but um, it has the, the downsides you know, with, with any sort of investment in the program, which is that it, it um, if something is not a project that we would have done otherwise, to some extent, it's a diversion of our core strategic effort. So the question I've been asking is, is there a way to involve foundations at a more strategic level at, at TED? And the, the idea that we're intrigued by is the possibility of forming a new um, nonprofit advisory board. So we start with the brain power that, that people from the nonprofit world can bring us because they're you have spent far more years than we have think, thinking about questions like, how really do you turn ideas into action? What, how can we reform education? How can we make a real impact in development? How can we take these inspiring ideas out there and actually do something with them? You've thought about that far, far more than uh, we know the answers to. So there's, there's, there's a lot of wisdom there. Um, and then, but secondly, by engaging people at a strategic level, it means that foundations can legitimately take credit for the full panoply of what of what TED is involved in. So just just to this is how I'm thinking about this. Some of this is this madness. So if you imagine um, a, a nonprofit board of, of say ten people, um, where there was an annual commitment to put in um, half a million dollars. Um, of TED overall. Collectively, that would be um, $10 million, would be 10% of, of TED's annual thing, which would provide a, a wonderful balance. That would mean that we would be part funded by our corporate partners, part by nonprofits, part by the people who pay to come to our conferences. Um, and each, so, so someone putting in half a million dollars, we count 1% of, of, of TED, be things like, I did the math on some of this. 
you know, you'd, you'd, set, you'd pay for one TED fellow to come, you'd pay for 1% of the impact of the TED Prize, which this year would mean creating 200 um, self-organized learning environments. You would account for 200 talks translated into another language. You would talk, account for 20 TEDx events around the world as 1% of the 2,000 that, that, that are held. Um, um, 150,000 kids seeing one of our TED Ed talks. We've just got a new initiative now into education um, that's generating 15 million annual views. And um, probably the single most important thing, 7 million um, TED Talk views. So half a million dollars, are, if you wanted to promote an idea out there in the world, Half a million dollars could probably cover about um, 50 meetings at which 500 people showed up. It was about 10 grand to do. By my rough calculation, you get about 100,000 talk views out of that, i.e. 100,000 people listening to a speaker if there were four speakers at each of those events. It's rough math. And that would be actually really good use of $500,000 for someone who wanted to was in the world of ideas and wanted to advance an idea, get it out there, but science, that's all education, whatever reason. Um, but because of the magic of the web and scale and people's willingness to, to spread these talks virally, the same half million as uh, accounts for 70 times that number of, of views on Pedagogy, so 7 million talk views. So if there was, if there was, a, every foundation is slightly different, but if there was a way of Foundations accepting that as, um, as 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 legitimately in line with their vision, their own mission, and coming and helping us as advisors to think more wisely about some of the issues that we're doing. It, to me, it would be an incredible win-win. It would sort of elevate the, the the level of participation we could have from the sector. It would help us raise our game, frankly, and um, and that's. Uh, my question, because I'm I have not spent any time to date out there in the in the um, the world of foundations trying to raise money or something. At one level, we haven't needed to, but I think we're at the point now where we feel like we actually want to because the scale of, of the opportunity in front of us is growing the whole time. And um, I'm curious as to whether that 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 type of involvement, as opposed to project-based involvement, could, could possibly work. So before we um, take um, the next question, should we have a little discussion of this? Re quick reactions. Do you have a quick reaction, please? Yeah. So, um, I think the first thing that comes to me is that we need to think about the process of the investment. Yes. And interested in coming in at the, if you like, the strategic level of participating in Ted's overall endeavor, as opposed to saying, right. find us a project that our money uniquely can fund, because the accounting overhead, the, sort of the management time over the, is, is very is very costly in its own way to do that piece. Whereas if it was any fraction of that level and the the, the impact, the, the prorated impact to the foundation. Is from my from my point of view, what absolutely would be would be there. Right, and I, and I, I know that unfortunately we as a sector tend to shy away from general operating, but we tend to teach our people to the board, so I'm sure that that's probably you're getting that from us. But I feel like as a small foundation, we like your overall concept and don't feel the need to dictate at a project level. We feel the need to contribute and just let you do what you do. And so that's what I'm saying is that it may it, it may be at a general Let's take a couple more. I mean, I think that's a very good, uh, quick. Uh, so one and two, and quick comments, maybe. We can.
to it. I think it's yeah. I, I, I feel the same way that it would be that we would we would we would most like engagement at that sort of strategic level as a a a project customized for that foundation. We have done the latter and we're willing to go there. But in terms of um, the, the greatest leverage of that foundation's resources and our own management resources, if there's a way of doing it at the strategic level, that that's that that uh, that makes over here. I think so. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. We're absolutely interested in doing that, but not actually not tied in that case to any financial contribution. I think that is incredibly important that those are two separate conversations because the the um, our, our promise to general visitors to TED.com is that this is a sort of a curated experience. We're going to try and find the most interesting voices, whoever they are, the ideas we're spreading. So Brian Stevenson last year, as, as mentioned, was was this astonishing talk that, that brought an issue that most people weren't aware of to public attention. Um, there was no money from him, but it was the, went the opposite way. The community ended up giving him a million dollars. Um, but um, um, so I wouldn't tie it as the answer to to financial contribution. I think those are two separate conversations. Yeah. I was just going to um, also. Um contribute to that question, which I think is a really great question. And I think people here in the room have something that's very valuable, which is your grantees, you're linked to communities, you're linked to people who are out there on the front lines. And their stories are very important. And I think one of the things that's very important about the TED model is that right now in a world where everybody has technology or a lot of people have technology in their hands to make sure that their stories can reach policy makers or decision makers so that their situation actually changes. Um, and I think that the, the role that TED plays of curating that content is actually very important. So that the, the model of having in the philanthropic world a, um, a platform where, where this, that the stories of the people that you work with can actually be amplified and can reach decision makers. Because one of the biggest dangers is we all live up with an enormous amount of media, but it's very, very hard to cut through the, to the, to the overflow of, of stories and to, to make sure that the story that really matters reaches the right decision maker so that accountability and justice can actually happen. Um, there's an amazing platform in the Middle East called Crowdvoice, which is run by one woman from the basement of her parents' house. But what she does is she amplifies the stories of, her name is Ezra al Shafai, but she amplifies the stories of many, many other people who are participating and amplifying their stories. And we did something very similar in partnership with Google. We created a, and Storyful, which is a blogger network, 
created a human rights channel because we realized that many people, the kind of people that you work with in your communities whose stories are uncovered and unheard, actually are filming and they're documenting their worlds. And it can also be youth in Alabama who's an LGBT youth who just needs to be part of their community and who needs to organize his campaign. And they're sharing their stories, but those platforms are not necessarily friendly to people who are change makers because their stories get buried or their privacy gets compromised. So what's very important is what we try to do with the Human Rights Channel um, uh, is to create a space where those stories can actually amplify. And also for that community who's now coming to the Human Rights Channel, provide them with resources. And I think the everybody in the foundation world can actually play a very important role in, in helping to create those communities and those spaces, whether it's convenings, where people can come together and actually sort of create that space of collaboration. So I would just offer a couple quick uh, thoughts to maybe we can tie up this particular discussion point and then move on. But I think you've got two really important issues that are, in a way, might have felt like you're presenting them as the same thing, but actually are two different elements. Your curatorial vision and independence is really critical here. And so what you're not offering is 10 shares of curatorial, you know, you know, join me in, you know. So let's just clarify that. I think that's, no one would benefit from being able to buy into that round. However, what you have created is a powerful platform that could be amplified. And if you could see the value in one talk, then amplifying the platform, you're not just amplifying that single talk, the one that might be most important to you, but all of the talks and, and the, the reach of all of that. And I think there there will be, I think, uh, some foundations who would want to participate at that level, uh, or, I mean, I would never speak for foundations and where they pitch in, but but would understand value in building the infrastructure to, 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 to grow the reach of all. Now, Emily's been very patient. Well, it's interesting because you guys brought up two things that were, I was going to ask about. The first was the phenomenon of the Brian Stevenson talk. So you have someone who's a leader of a nonprofit that everybody is just uh, a big interest in criminal justice reform. So this was a video that circulated amongst my peers very, very quickly. But the idea, like, it was not intentional that someone who leads a nonprofit would have this platform and that people would raise their hand and give a million dollars. So is that so that, that, does that set some sort of a precedent that, you know, is that like a one-time thing or is that just this is spontaneous and is this really quite an extraordinary platform for nonprofits that do what's considered sort of unsexy work that really needs to be heard by a new, about by a new audience? And then to me, it was incredible to see the phenomenon of people who could not have cared less about criminals raising their hand and giving money for the first time, very inspirational. And, and that sort of also leads to the public policy maker and decision maker question, is there any intentional dissemination to those people who are in power about the certain issues that are brought up in TED Talks to, you know, to share those messages to those who could potentially really make a difference on the sort of government? Two big questions. The, the second one, the, the answer is simple: that we, there is no um, intentional program. We can count on people like you to do it for us. It's a, it's a link away, a board away. But we we probably could get wiser about doing that. We don't currently. Um, Lee Brian, that that Brian Stevenson, that was a one-off. We, we would like to think that anything can happen at any moment. It's a tech conference, but you know, it's not there's not a formula there. In that particular instance, the audience reaction to the talk was so strong, we got the biggest standing ovation in Ted's history, that we felt like we needed to do that, and there was an instant response. More generally, uh, we don't connect talks to raising funds. Once a year, we have a winner who does get a million dollars, and, and, and that's an, an experiment in mass collaboration and trying to persuade as many people as possible to get behind, behind one person's vision. That is something which anyone can uh, um, nominate for, um, you know, that including with, if I was to give a talk at TED, this is what my wish would be. 
we're looking for very big, bold, imaginative, you know, projects. And um, um, but in all, you know, we have we actually feel like you, we have to be careful about how much cause-related material we bring into the conference because, as I said, we're we're in a, an intention of we're dealing with the vicissitudes of human psychology. And the tragic truth is that people are good, but people get bored easily. And people have um, shockingly low kind of compassion fatigue levels. One person's deeply felt cause and another person's get me out of here now um, moment. And, um, and, and so we, 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 we try to juggle that as best we can. We try to create an environment where people are opened up and curious and open to possibility. And um, during the course of a four-day program, I might be introduced to half a dozen people with something that you could say is cause related. But but it's if we did if we turn over the program to that, we would lose our, our audience. Um, so. I wonder if I could ask you to circle back to the the first question here in this uh, round and um, not buying in you know the that round of you know that you were suggesting. In a sense you took that as an opportunity to open up that question of the strategic relationship. But going back to the smaller question of okay that was an, a remarkable individual who was working on pain management issues. And um, Christina could have brought that to you in some way. You've got a room full of people who have incredible talent. How do they bring that talent to you? Um, you know, with the obvious uh, proviso that you make the, the cuts and the calls and things like that. Do you mean how, how someone would bring a proposal for a talk? For us? example, yeah. Sure. Um, well, so, so a number of thoughts. I mean, just you did ask how people can get involved, and so for starting, attending is one. So Ted, our California, now Vancouver conference does sell out, but TED Global, which is our sort of staff favorite conference, is in June in Edinburgh, Scotland, and you usually can get into TED. TED Global doesn't sell out as quickly, and it's a wonderful way to experience the conference and also what works and what doesn't on stage. And I think in terms of um, the, the grantees that you have, there are there. Are, Probably three things I'd say. One is that um, you can definitely make us aware of them by um, people nominate speakers on our site all the time. It's probably how we find a fourth, a third of our speech just because people tell us about them. We can't be everywhere in the world. We depend on them. Um, second is that there are a lot of local TEDx events around the world, and that's the perfect training ground for speakers. And I think the, the bigger picture to say is that there is a power in having your grantees learn how to give a great talk because it's incredibly impactful. And that talk doesn't have to be at the main TED. It can be at a TEDx. It could be at another event like that. Um, but sort of encouraging that among them and trying to get involved with any of the local TEDx's is, is great. And you can find listings of all the TEDx events on our website. Some of those talks do come onto TED.com, ultimately. Um, some of them just do very well. They're all posted to YouTube as well on their own. But I think embracing on that level. And then I think on our end, we'll also keep thinking through how this program might work. And to, to your point earlier as well, um, who knows, maybe there is a, 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 a level that isn't, you know, a million dollars a year at which there's a great benefit that can be exchanged. And maybe that's not in curation necessarily, but maybe there's some way that we can share some of the insights about what makes a TED Talk to your grantees or other ways of bringing this out. I don't know, we're kind of thinking on the fly here, but there might be something really interesting there um, to explore other ways of we have a question over here. So, uh, yeah, two, quick, two quick questions. The first relates to TEDx. It seems like that's an area where funders might be able to get involved and help sponsor or co sponsor some of these TEDx events. For example, a community where we feel like open voices are not being heard, um, not standing, contributing to that. Or if there's a particular theme or set of themes that our foundations work on, maybe sponsor a TEDx that focuses on that theme. So, that's my first thing. We've is that model that would successfully work? My second question relates to television. You said you had a hard time sort of finding where this fits with television. My, my first thought was a competition show. We talked about American Idol earlier, but a lot of people feel like they have that one idea to share. And if you were to have several contestants, <laughs> each of whom has an idea to share, and then you see their back, you know, you have the, the, the inner city pop and the, the rural agronomist and the <laughs> Ivy League. Uh, behavioral economists and all of them kind of own their TED talk and it's a competition at the end. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> 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 and that, the, read that last one. The, the, um, um, 
um, you should come join the team, really, because we, we, last year, <laughs> we got very excited for at least a month about that very idea. <laughs> um, American idea, or some other name, uh, actually global. In fact, we did, we did a global talent search that almost got um, a cameras coming with us. And we literally did a different city, 14 states, the best of the top. Um, so some, some, maybe Simon Cowell will get excited by your idea and call us up. Um, on the, on the, the TEDx piece, the way TEDx works is that the licenses are given to a location, usually. So if it's TEDx, my local place, which might be, you know, a city or part of a city. Um, we, we don't give licenses to sort of um, cause names. So, because those, because that content is, is, um, relevant globally, and so it's, it's part of lots of events, so we don't do things uh, in general like you know, TEDx stick fibrosis or, or whatever. Um, and, and also the TED, TED events tend to work with, with a broader dev content, but um, individual, an individual event might well want to, I mean it depends how broad the cause is, but people have done um, events, you know, like a, a TEDx Chicago might do an event that was largely based on education, for example. Um, so th there is definitely some some room there. Could you help sponsor a TEDx in a South Asian city, regardless of Yes, uh, absolutely. And um, that's, that's such a great that way to go too, to think be, about those regions be. and neighborhoods that are, are underserved. It's a great way of serving them and getting those voices. Well. So who's the well. who contacts you then from the city? Um, just someone who who has the vision to do an event. And we make the judgment, um, and it takes someone with a lot of entrepreneurial um, instinct and, and passion and <laughs> so on. Yeah, I think uh, the, in the case of TEDx Mid-Atlantic, I think the Case Foundation was very heavily involved in shaping that one, and I'm sure there are other examples too, Yvette. No, I was just going to say that I, I really like that model, right? Because, again, like it provides a forum for people to come together, or, and it doesn't have to be pure cost-related, but for communities, for local, rural, or, or urban communities come together in a sort of a mini version. If you look at Good Pitch Does, uh, which is organized by the Brit Doc Foundation, they put people all around the table, and it may be people making a documentary about a specific cause, and then funders are at the table, or people who can actually help the reach strategy or an engagement strategy or just experts on, on that issue and by starting a project on in such an involved way it's really it's just from the get-go having the right brains together in the room makes a lot of sense so i think that's that that model would be great okay you had a radical idea for this session that we would actually end about 10 minutes early so we're not there yet but um just so we're aiming for 45 and another 50 minutes or so um to give people first the opportunity to uh, network in a more informal way after we close the mics, um, but also it's a beautiful day, so some of you might want to slip out before you're trained. <laughs> exactly, that's an idea. So, if we were wanting to, you know, if we had an event lined up very specific, you know, um, what would be TEDx in a box without the TEDx. <laughs> <laughs> we, we welcome, we wel absolutely welcome people doing um, our format under their own brand. Um, most of the sort of the how-to um, is is out there in one form or another. There's some advice on our site. People have published books on how to give it. But the, the basic notion of doing a TED-like format is, is is already way out there, and it's been actually been thrilling to see how many other organizations have said things. This is going to be a TED-like event, and we, we, we always smile uh, joyfully when we see that because it's 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 great. It works. Do you mention TED at any time, or how we just that we do work with corporate? Just to say that we actually, I mean, we do really welcome partnerships with corporations as well. We think they're 
filled with people with ideas as well. And so we, we do events like we just did one at Intel called TED at Intel that we was more white labeled and that we helped a lot more and worked with them to find and, and unearth curate the ideas within their own organizations. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And and so uh, we we are actually working on that quite a bit right now through what we call our TED Institute um, initiative and we can we can fill you in on that. But we really welcome it, we think it has a huge She's back in the game. <laughs> we don't have a specific agenda. There's no sort of official TED view that at the sort of granularity of this is what exactly what justice looks like. This is what injustice looks like. It's, so so we, we deliberately want to be as broad tent as we can be. We describe ourselves as nonpartisan, um, and um, we, we want as we want to engage as many people as possible. Um, nonetheless, um, you know, people who speak at TED or can get involved. Um, should tend to share a lot of values in common about um, um, connectedness, uh, um, possibility, and so on. But we, we, we see our role as, as conveners, not as pushing a specific agenda. So, uh, so I mean, there's room, there's room in an event for, for example, a TEDx organizer to bring together um, three or four people who have a specific view about how, you know, want to articulate a particular way of achieving justice or tax and injustice. For it to be a successful TEDx event, probably, it shouldn't be um, monochrome in content. You know, the more you have, like, the, the same agenda from different speakers, it can, it can feel wrong. Part of the joy of these events is that you have a variety of views. And so uh, an organizer might well want to throw in a counterpoint of view or um, just a cultural break and, you know, some, something more artistic or aesthetic or some music or performance or whatever. But, but um, so, so that is really down to an individual curator and organizer is what I would say. We, we don't take a view on, on those issues, but we're thrilled to see social change happen as a result of TED events. Um, that's probably as good as I can get to. So, so the question is, um, are we concerned at dilution of the brand or and or overexposure of the brand? That too many TED Talks, TEDx Talks finally gets people bored. And um, I would say that we do think about that. I think um, I think it's true that you can spend, you can listen to too many TED Talks, you can go to too many events and get bored. Um, but the overall view of knowledge, if you like, is that there isn't a limited supply of it. I, 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 the world doesn't get less interesting the more you understand it. It's more interesting. Um, in general, a good a good talk doesn't um, doesn't just give you an aha moment. It creates a hundred more questions in your mind. I think that to me that's the nature of knowledge. Is every step of the journey you go. You, you round a bend and the view gets gets more interesting. And and and, and my only claim is that come day three, you, you sort of find yourself thinking, the world cannot be this impossibly wonderful or interesting. I mean, it, 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 it it's that sense of it. So I would say I would say that there uh, that there are risks, but it's that people don't, people shouldn't watch too many talks. Um, but what is too many? You know. So 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 I I, I think most. Settle into some 
kind of um, habit, like a lot of our online audience are settling into a habit of about <laughs> a talk a day. Um, a lot of people, um, night or whatever, some people on the weekend, you just don't want to do that too, too often. <laughs> I've been trying desperately to get them to squeeze them out of them over here. I wonder, well, you wanted a one-minute clip. Which is yeah, 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 that's true. For this, for this group, I mean, a, a, a provocative but um, um, mesmerizing talk is the Dan Palotta talk. He's a polarizing figure, I guess. But, um, but this talk is an amazing example of the power of logic to sway a crowd. He basically argues that the way we think of, of our philanthropic efforts is, is completely screwed up and makes a very persuasive argument as to why. Um, worth watching, whether you agree with him or, or not. Um, so that, that would certainly be one favorite. Um, and another thing, I, I, I mean, if you haven't seen it, you know, the, 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 the single talk with the most views is um, Ken Robinson's talk. Ken, it was actually one of the first we, we watched. Um, back six years ago, well, when it was recorded, it was seen by 800 people. Um, when we first put it online, it quickly built to an audience of two or three thousand people every day, and we were overjoyed. And now it's seen by about um, half a million people a month. Um, yeah, fifteen thousand people a day. Yeah. And um, six, seven years later, it's 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 persuaded. He, you know, he argues that schools have it wrong that they kill creativity in kids that we need a better way, and he's he is single-handed persuaded. And convince thousands and thousands of people to do something about education reform. Um, so. Stevenson, that would be worth watching for together for a minute. I'd, 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 I'd always do Brian Stevenson, given that he's his. So we talked about Brian Stevenson, Stevenson yeah. and so yeah. maybe you can help us get to the link here. One other I would just add speakers. as an opposition. Uh, 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 just do B R Y A N and that'll be that'll come out. Um, a talk from two thousand three by Wade Davis. The filming, it was before we did we were officially filming for TED Talk, so the filming isn't great. But he's a national geographic explorer. He talks about the tragedy of the loss of languages around the world. And he speaks about language in a cool way that language is in grammar and vocabulary, every language is an old growth forest of the mind. And um, I was in the audience at that time, which was before I worked for Chris, and it was um, just, I found it incredibly inspiring. I was like, there's something I have to do about this at some point, and the translation project always makes me think of it. Wade Davis? Should we go to this one? Yeah, there's just a, a masterclass in how to connect with an audience, how to be vulnerable, how to bring in a really tough issue gently. The audience didn't even know you know, I guess, you know, he, he tells a story um, at the start, which is very interesting. So it's probably four minutes. This one too is a really extraordinary honor for me. I spent most of my time in jails and prisons on death row. I spent most of my time in very low income communities and in projects and places where there's a great deal of hopelessness. And being here at TED and seeing the simulation, hearing it, has been very, very energizing to me. Oh. Immerse my short time and has an identity. And you can actually say things here that have impacts around the world. Sometimes when it comes through TED, it has meaning and power that it doesn't have when it doesn't. I mentioned that because I think identity is really important. We had some fantastic presentations. And I think what we learned is that if the teacher, if the words can be meaningful, if you're compassionate, if you're especially if you're a doctor, you can do some good things, but if you're a caring doctor, you can do some other things. So I want to talk about the power of identity. And I didn't learn about this actually practicing law or the work that I do, right? I actually learned about this from my grandmother. I grew up in a house uh, that was a traditional African-American home that was dominated by a matriarch, and that matriarch was my grandmother. And she was tough, she was strong, she was powerful. She was the end of every argument in our family. Uh, she was the beginning of a lot of arguments in our family. Uh, she was the daughter of people who were actually enslaved. Uh, 
But you know, she was the one in the 1880s, and the experience of slavery very much shaped the way she saw the world. And my mother, my grandmother's top, she was also loving. And I would see her as a little boy, she'd come up to me, and she'd give me these hugs, and she'd squeeze me so tight I could barely breathe. And then she'd let me go. Two later, she'd come up to me and she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said no, she'd assault me again, and I'd say, yes, she'd leave me alone. And then she just had this quality that she always wanted to be near her. And then the challenge was that she had 10 children. My mom was the younger of her 10 kids. The time when I would go, the time with her would be difficult to get her time and attention. I could everywhere. And I remember uh, when I was about eight or nine years old, waking up one morning, going into the living room, and all my cousins were home. My grandmother was sitting across the room, staring at me. And at first, I thought we were playing the games. I look at her, I smile, and she was very serious. And after about 15 or 20 years of this, she got up and she came across. She took me by the hand. She said, come on, buddy, you're not going to have a talk. And I remember this just like it happened yesterday. And then we the day. She took me out back and she said, well, I'm going to tell you something, but you don't tell anybody that I've done it. I said, okay, Mom. She said, are you make sure you don't do that? I said, sure. Then she sat me down, she looked at me, and she said, I want you to know I've been watching you. And she said, I think you're special. She said, I think you can do anything you want to do. I will never forget it. And she, then she said, I think you need to promise me three things. I said, okay, Mom. She said, the first thing I want you to promise me is that you'll always love your mom. She said, that's my baby girl. You just the mail, you'll always take care of her. Well, I have to live my mom. I said, yes, my mom will do that. Then she said, the second thing I want you to promise me is that you'll always do the right thing. Even in the right thing, it's the hard thing. Thought about it, and I said, That's not my husband. Then finally, she said, The third thing I want you to promise me is that you'll never drink alcohol. Before <laughs> <laughs> I was nine years old, so I said, Yes, mama, I'll do that. I, I grew up in a country in the rural south, and I had a brother, you're older than me, and a sister, you're younger. <laughs> 15 or 15, my brother came home, and he had this six pack. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I said about four minutes, but... Yeah, there's, there's, about another, there's not another half minute or so to go. Yeah, sorry, guys. And he grabbed me and my sister, we went out in the woods, and we were kind of just out there doing the stuff we crazily did, and he had a sip of the spirit, he gave some to my sister, and she had something. They offered it to me. I said, no, 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 it's okay, y'all go, like, I'm not going to have any beer. My brother said, come on, we're doing this today, you always do what we do. I had some beer, sister had some beer. I said, no, I don't like it. I said, y'all go ahead, y'all go ahead. And then my brother started staring at me. He said, what is, what's wrong with you? Have some beer. He looked at me real hard and he said, Oh, I hope you're not still in love with that conversation. Mom and dad with you. He said, Well, Mama tells all the grandkids that they're special. I was devastated. And I'm going to admit something to you. I'm going to tell you something I probably shouldn't. I know this is my people. I don't know how to solve it, but I'm 52 years old. And I'm going to admit to you. I don't say that because I think that's virtuous. I say that because there's this power that I have in it. the right kind of idea. You can say things to the world about us that they don't actually believe makes sense. You can get them to do things that they don't think they can do. When I thought that my grandmother called, of course she would think all of anything is special. My grandfather was in prison doing prohibition. That's, that's okay. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Well, you know what's, what's um, amazing about is that he only had 80 minutes. He spent, what, five minutes of it on a story that's actually not that relevant to the, <laughs> the rest of the content. I mean, the link between that, that story and identity um, and his, his arguments around um, injustice in the prison system, um, not necessarily that relevant, but to, for, the, for the impact of the talk, it was crucial because it made everyone fall in love with him. Um, it, his, his, his subtle use of the way he phrases stuff, I'm going to admit to you, as opposed to boast in front of you. And you know, it, 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 It's actually genius how he phrases that. And um, I don't know, I think it, it, you know, if you want to really persuade and inspire, you can't just think about the special content of it. You, you have to manage the storytelling, the emotional, the personal, 
connection. And then what, what followed, he, he owned the audience. But it's, it's, it's really a, an, an amazing achievement. I don't fully understand how he pulled that off, but, uh, but he did. So if you watch the rest of it, you'll see he goes from there with the searing talk, with, including the phrase towards the end about um, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, it's justice. And uh, it, it, he just had a way of making you think about issues differently. I guess he didn't develop it for you. I know, it's Did a talk, it's a talk he's given hundreds of... Show, and he didn't make that up for the TED audience. Uh, but he also employs very classic storytelling, uh, and I think for all of your grantees, this is amazing. For me, I watch it. It teaches me how to talk about witness, right? Because he, it's like Obama. He starts with the story of himself, and then the story of us, and now you have a shared value with him, and he says, "Well, actually, this is what I do." It's brilliant. Yeah, and it's both of those things, but I think it's, for the topic uh, today, it's a talk that he gave probably hundreds of times, and it does reflect his skill as a storyteller, but he was able to deliver it on a platform that reached yeah. millions. And so, um, do we have any small questions, short questions? Otherwise, we're going to wind things down. And any uh, final comments? Just to you. Just that um, when I step back from the day today and, and look at the, the, the TED story, one, one way of viewing it is as um, a kind of a, a tale of hope for, for the world. Because there, there's a very, there's a, there are a couple of depressing narratives out there. Um, there's a narrative about getting dumbed down. Um, there's a narrative about um, cynicism, uh, really becoming the sort of the, the, the dominant mindset and especially on online you know you see online you can see communities developing that some days feel like they're nasty rather than anything else you know you have these, these ugly online wars between people who seem to be living in separate separate worlds and um but the the uh, the, the, the TED story is, is that there's there's a, there's a rival narrative to that, which is that there is at least a group of people. Are they critical mass? I don't know. On, on good days, I really believe that they are. Who are curious, who really want to learn, who believe that knowledge matters and that it can be transitive, who believe in global vision. Uh, they don't think tribally. They think ideas know no borders, and, and they're, they're thrilled by that. Um, they believe in the power of of connection, they believe in the power of inspiration, and they believe that um, a group of people who share an idea and a vision can actually get something thrilling done. So, wh where does it go? Does that narrative beat out the, the other narrative in the long run? Who, who knows? But on, on a good day, I can feel truly hopeful, looking at the numbers, looking at the numbers continuing to climb, and the many people who get excited about this way of sharing um, ideas. Um, you know, I certainly get get hope from that, and and a lot of motivation to keep doing what we're doing and trying to fine tune it constantly, get it wiser. You know, I, I hope and believe that this is still early days. Well, I know that um, philanthropy New York is also a place that believes in ideas that are worth spreading, and so I want to thank Rana Brown, president here, and uh, her team, Peter Jahedi and Nur Abraham and and um, Sorry, Nadia, <laughs> who's been uh, tweeting furiously throughout this. So thanks, Nadia, uh, for doing that, and Yvonne for in in introducing. Um, just to remind you that we've got a full day of focusing on impact storytelling on June 4th at the Ford Foundation. Be in touch with me if you'd like to learn more about that event. And I want to thank uh, Chris and June and Yvette for joining us today. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you so much.